Good afternoon. I'm Twain Hickman from the MAGTAF Instructional Group, Marine Corps University. It's my honor and privilege to be here today with General Gray, 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, Lieutenant General Van Riper, former Commanding General, Marine Corps Combat Development Command, and Mr. John Schmidt, who wrote the Keystone Marine Corps Doctrinal Manuals, Ground Combat Operations and Campaigning, as well as the Capstone MCDP-1 Warfighting. We're here today to explore the topic of warfighting history of the MCDP, roots of maneuver warfare, and the doctrine in action. Thank you gentlemen very much for making the time to join us today. It's our hope to enable a conversation between you all to explore warfighting and maneuver warfare. Gentlemen, my first question is, what conditions were present that allowed for the discussion, debate, and dialogue surrounding maneuver warfare? When uh, we came out of uh, Vietnam, there was a period which the Corps had to get back on its feet. It had to uh, take care of recruiting the kind of Marines we wanted, get the gear back in shape, uh, ba basically to get up and be functioning. And it wasn't long after that, into the mid-1970s, uh, we began to focus on operations. At the time, I was uh, down at the 2nd Marine Division, was the operations officer for a battalion, and then later uh, operations officer for 8th Marine Regiment. And it was uh, during that period that some of these ideas that we now know as maneuver warfare began to emerge. I recall the uh, first time I got really excited about it was the 4th Marine Amphibious Brigade then was going out to uh, Northern Europe to run an exercise. And we spent almost a year in preparation. General Gray was the uh, brigade commander and he gave us a lot of guidance. And so we were uh, beginning to think about these sorts of things. And there were a lot of highlights uh, that I would love to relate. One of them was uh, when I was the Regimental 3, General Gray put together a task force one late one afternoon, uh, assembled the, uh, a battalion, took an artillery uh, battery, a, a tank company, uh, pulled me up from the regiment to be this little task force 3, and we assembled in something like eight hours, wrote an op order, and we're on the road uh, on our way behind the 6th Panzer Grenadier Division in a flanking maneuver that uh, surprised everybody, including the uh, umpires of that exercise. Uh, that, that was a highlight, sir. And yeah. You were in an AAV and I was in another one. We were rolling, but rolling by, the, uh, yeah. by the German countryside. Huh? Yeah, we came yeah. close to rolling into East Germany. That's right. <laughs> so that, was, uh, that was sort of, uh, there were a lot of exercises like that throughout the Marine Corps. That's the one that comes to, to mind for me. Uh, I know, John, you were down in division a little later than that when they started talking about uh, using light armored reconnaissance units. Right. Well, so I, I joined the fight in the 80s. I got my commission in, in 81, showed up in 2nd Marine Division in 1982. Shortly, or about the same time, you took over command of the division. And I, I remember as a brand new 2nd Lieutenant going to an all division officers call at the base theater. Every officer in the division and the, divi the brand new division commander got up there personally on the stage and said uh, maneuver warfare is the official doctrine of the second marine division get on board with it and um, i thought i better get on board with it and so i started reading up and um, it was immediately appealing to me um, first of all because it was it was empowering to junior officers to think that you would have the kind of authority that that was being described was was just a fantastic opportunity and secondly because everything that i had read about the nature of war suggested that this was just uh, the right way to do it. So I, I immediately got very enthusiastic about it. Um, every year there was the combined arms operation at Fort Pickett, Virginia, and I, I was fortunate enough that my battalion went there twice, uh, so I got to participate in it. And um, every year General Gray would have a surprise. One year you brought in a battalion from the 82nd Airborne, unannounced, dr just dropped into the middle of the exercise, and just you know completely threw everybody for a loop. Uh, another year there was an unexpected chemical attack, and, and we all had to deal with that. But what was really fascinating about that exercise is every single day, about 1630, we called NDEX, and all the officers and staff NCOs would hop in their Jeeps and drive back to the base theater and pack the base theater, and the division commander personally would lead the after-action review of the day's exercises, and Bill Lind would be sitting up there on stage with them and in, engaging in, in the exercises. And I remember, as the anti-armor platoon commander for 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines, being called on by the division commander to explain how my heavy machine guns had been used in a reconnaissance pull operation to find the gaps in the chemical fields so that we could exploit the gaps and get into the enemy rear. So that was um, exciting for a second lieutenant to have to do that. 
Now, General Gray, I think uh, you were exposed to the ideas of maneuver warfare well before you were the Second Marine Division Commander. Is that true? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, you know professionals. Uh, in our profession do a lot of reading. They're supposed to read a lot of history and this and that. And there's no question that uh, both of these gentlemen, my colleagues, uh, are well known for being uh, uh, great readers and, and thinkers. And, and uh, I, as a young person, spent a lot of time overseas and so I had an opportunity to read a great deal and uh, about a lot of things. Uh, and uh, most uh, Military people were familiar with the so-called Prussian uh, way of doing things and Clausewitz and all that kind of thing, and we all studied and read and thought about that. Uh, I uh, am a, a Sun Tzu or a Sun Tzu uh, proponent myself, and, and having spent 22 years in the Far East and the like, have a lot of that kind of Asian uh, influence in, in, in thinking and so on. One of the things that uh, I was a student of really in the earlier days was deception, tactical deception, strategic deception, that kind of thing. And there are a lot of things that, there are a lot of uh, elements that we ultimately embraced in maneuver warfare and that kind of thing that really were not necessarily maneuver warfare, but we, they, we gathered them all up, deception and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, at the, uh, for example, in 1964 when I was leading the special operations uh, outfit in, uh, out north of Quezon. We actually landed on another mountaintop, pretended to go there, and then went to another mountaintop, those kind of things. So, so I think, uh, and then having a little bit of reconnaissance background and intelligence background, all that kind of thing. So these are the kind of things that I used to think about when I'd read about it. Of course, we all read uh, Rommel and General Slim and people like that. So we had a pretty good, uh, uh, we had a pretty good knowledge of really of, of, of what happened. I'm not a history buff, uh, never was, never will be. And in other words, I don't quote dates and times and this and that, but you try to look at these things from the reason why. As we said many times in the critiques that, uh, at, uh, that John alluded to at Fort Pickett, uh, I'm not really interested in uh, uh, whether you went to the left or whether we went to the right. I'm interested in what you thought about. And that was the key. We were trying to get people to think. So, uh, and then uh, many of us uh, in our Vietnam experience uh, uh, were uh, suffered under attrition type warfare and tactics and this and that. And when you look back and study the, uh, the Korean War and the Vietnam War and the like, uh, uh, we made some mistakes we never should make again. And, uh, and so all of this is part of your background, part of your thought process and part of the uh, of your dialogue that you have with your fellow uh, Marines and the like when you talk about operations. In, uh, in 1976, when at the end of the Vietnam War, as General von Riper pointed out, uh, uh, it was uh, in some ways similar to today. Uh, the people had been wrapped up for a long time in, in a ground kind of an environment, a ground war if you will. Uh, we had uh, we had lost uh, some of our amphibious skills and expeditionary skills and the like, particularly at the larger uh, brigade and and, and, and met forward size units uh, and, and the like. We uh, uh, we had terrible disciplinary problems from about 1968 or so until uh, the end, until as General Von Riper has, has alluded to, General Wilson, for example increase the quality. And that's an interesting idea, by the way. The, uh, the man that I think really should get the credit for that is General Bob Nichols. He's gone now, but General Nichols was the commanding general of the Force Service Support Group at Camp Azune in the 1972-73 uh, time frame when I had BLT-1-2 and later the 2nd Marines and later the G-3. And he invited me over to his command post one time and we sat there and we were looking at all these charts. Back in these days, everybody charts on everything. Remember that? Red, Green, red, yellow, red, 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 red. <laughs> The meat wall charts. And they, they measured everything except how good you could fight. I mean, everything else was, was measured. Yeah. And, and he was looking, they said, look at that. He said, Al, he said, the, uh, the majority of the people that go UA and the majority of the people that desert are non-high school graduates. 
And he carried that message forward when he later became uh, uh, head of manpower in Washington under General Wilson. And of course, General Wilson is known to have increased the uh, requirement for high school graduates initially 92 percent, and then that grew, as everybody knows. So that's where that came from. But uh, for example, when we were in Okinawa in 1974, uh, we had 8,000 Marines at Camp Hansen, and 55 uh, percent did not have a high school diploma. And so we started a high school. And it was right on the training schedule for the infantry and everybody else. And uh, where you used to have riots and fights and this and that, all of a sudden you had uh, blacks helping whites, African Americans helping whites with homework, and Samoans in their study and everybody working together. And, and the leaders saw how that, uh, that panned out and it was good for everybody. So uh, those are the kind of things that we were faced with. But getting back to operations and the maneuver type thing, in, uh, in 1976, General Wilson was uh, very concerned about the Marine Corps role in NATO. Uh, we had been over there in 1975, we had not done very well, and uh, his mission type guidance to me uh, after I made Brigadier was uh, uh, go over there and, and, and show NATO how good we really can be. I want you to do that and I also want you to uh, make sure that you conduct all your operations and keep their hands off our air and a few other uh, mission type guidance uh, messages and the like. And, but never once the how and all that, uh, that was left up to the commanders, that was left up to us. And uh, so he, uh, he formed then the first uh, permanent MAB command group. That was the 4th Marine Amphibious Brigade that uh, General Van Riper alluded to. And our first big operation, as I said, was in 1976. We went to North War Norway and then Denmark and then Northern Germany. And, um, and it was a very successful operation. And, and some of the key tenets began to emerge out of that. And we, uh, we were a very busy brigade. We also had uh, the next year a big operation in, in Turkey where we did some of the same things. Uh, we went 60 miles the first day and the like in Turkey and, and, and uh, we made a, 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 an all-night uh, helicopter-borne uh, operation in the Caribbean in 1977 when it was against Marine Corps policy to fly helicopters at night <laughs> and that kind of thing. I, I was thinking you were talking, General, about deceptions. You, you had some great deceptions in that. One of them was we had eight-inch uh, howitzers that time and eight-inch howitzers were known to be well in the rear. Uh, General Gray had us put the eight-inch howitzer out on combat outpost line uh, and then begin to fire in terms of, of uh, what was supposed to be, the, the firing actually was you said you would fire, the umpires would go to the area where the rounds were impact, throw some simulators and, and let them know what was happening. Well, the Germans saw eight-inch coming in, assumed that they were almost on top of the fort edge of our battle area, the FIBA, and so they deployed. But they actually were were well uh, short of the combat outpost line, and it's it slowed them up for 24 hours because they had to regroup and come back in. Yeah. And then deceptions, uh, you had us take uh, CH-53s, uh, a couple of them, and we put uh, just a handful of Marines in them with radios. Uh, landed, let the Marines out. They began to broadcast as if a battalion was on the ground. Uh, 53s returned, and then later, and then just before dusk. A Huey comes in and picks up those radio operators and flew away, and the Germans were absolutely convinced that they had a battalion that was ma yeah. maneuvering in an area yeah. wasn't safe. Yeah. I mean, those were fun days. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and these kind of things, uh, again, uh, John hit it. There was a lot of empowerment going on. We were letting corporals and sergeants and young officers do things that they never dreamed of being able to do at the early <laughs> time in their Marine Corps life and all. And, and uh, I mean, the whole the whole uh, idea of, of, of letting younger people do more and all that kind of thing and then kind of pulling all this together into a, a philosophy is, is what was done over that 10 year period, I think. It, it really, uh, the, the Maneuver Warfare uh, book, if you will, uh, in my humble opinion, is more of a philosophy than it is doctrine. Yes. And, and, uh, it, uh, in fact, I made a mistake in the forward by using the word doctrine. I wish I hadn't done that. 
Then I remember a couple of years later, I wanted to make some adjustments to it. Uh, and you said, no, no, it's fine the way it is. And, and later on, of course, you were told to make some adjustments to it. And so adjustments were made. But anyway, that's getting ahead of the story here. Can, can I make an observation about the reading? Um, because General Gray had mentioned the reading. And, and there was, I think, a small group that did a lot of professional reading and was very well informed. And, and yeah. they're the ones that were sort of on the vanguard of, yeah. of that movement. But professional reading was not widespread no. in the Marine no. Corps at that time. In fact, there was, there was still sort of an, an anti-intellectual current that ran through the institution. And I think that's one of the most significant uh, reforms that happened during the Great Commandancy was professional reading became expected of everybody and it became widespread and it became a much more uh, informed and, and better educated officer and NCO Corps as a result. And it paid huge dividends. But there was a direct correlation with those who were at the center of this yes. and those who read. Yes. Uh, those who were professionally schooled and read were, were there. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned early on not to challenge the general about whether he had read a document or not. This is a little bit later, but. Uh, uh, we were getting interested in command post and improving our command post and downsizing them. And the general came out to Okinawa and was looking at battalion, regimental, and division command post. And I mentioned a little booklet that the government printing offices had put out, that was written uh, unexpectedly by an Air Force major. And I mentioned it. The general said, "Yeah, I read that." And I'm a little suspect, suspect of my commandant that he actually read it until I started talking to him, and he, yeah. he had read it. Yeah. And it was never a book that uh, I mentioned. You talk about book. Right. Yeah. Uh, how, how many how many books do you did you have in your library, sir? They just inventory and I'm gonna move all down to the research center now. A couple thousand? Thirty one hundred. Thirty one hundred books. I I did find a book that I had read before you. When you came to the commissioning ceremony at U of I in nineteen ninety one, you were the guest speaker and we didn't know what to get you and Martin Van Creveld's Command and War had just come out. Right. I literally right. just come out and I got one of the very first copies and I surprised you with it as yeah. a gift for coming. Mm -hmm. That was a great book, by the way, too. That's yeah, classic, yeah. Uh, unlike some of his later books. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He his earlier books were were right on, and then I think he got a little bit transformation of war, and yeah, some of the other ones got off. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, some folks have called uh, what happened during this period an intellectual transformation of the Marine Corps, and it sounds like a lot about what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I think, think that's, that's a good descriptor. I don't use it because it sounds kind of you know self-serving and all, but I think it's it's. Uh, I think the Marine Corps in general, uh, uh, in that era, from, from, the, from the end of the Vietnam conflict until uh, uh, the early 90s at least, were, were definitely uh, intellectually far more prepared than, than everybody thought. And, and that seemed to be you know, the kind of thing to do, and there was, a, there was an earnest effort on the part of uh, of most leaders to get better and, and to help their people be better and all that type of thing. But uh, I think the, you know, I remember um, when we came out with a reading list, for example, and I got a letter from a father in uh, Colorado and uh, I made a habit of reading all my own mail when I was on my last tour. It paid big dividends. Anyway, he said, uh, and I said, what the heck are you doing to my Marine Corps? He said, this guy was a Marine too. He said, my son came home from 13 months in Okinawa. The first thing he asked his mother is, that library is still around the corner. <laughs> <You know. laughs> we used the term uh, uh, intellectual transformation. I think intellectual renaissance would have been more accurate because transformation indicates you're transforming into something you weren't. Marine Corps had a long history of intellectual activities in terms of the doctrine that was developed for amphibious operations, for helleborne operations for small wars. So it, uh, it's intellectually uh, rich, but we seem to drift away from that during Vietnam and in the immediate years afterwards. So I'm, I'm with the general, I'm not sure we want to use the term yeah. intellectual, but it would be renaissance, yeah, not more, transformation. Yeah, you're right, you're exactly right. And I think uh, it's important to remember too that the, the, you know, the, the, the Marine Corps every once in a while goes through a period where they have to get back to the basics, get back to the uh, what they really are, uh, understand the uh, that they're warriors and the war fighting mentality and get back to the kind of thought process that uh, you have to have uh, uh, constantly in the Marine Corps and that's the operational thought process. Everything revolves around your ability to execute whether you're a lance corporal or a general or anything uh, in between. And during the, during the uh, 70s and, and so on we had, uh, we had a lot of things we had to do. Uh, 
when I came here, to, uh, when I was at the uh, development center earlier as a lieutenant colonel of combat development center, for example, we, uh, we made great strides in improving our intelligence surveillance reconnaissance capability. Integrated ISR, if you will, was uh, uh, beginning to be really, really thought of, and I think a decade later that we, we saw that, and, and of course you see it in spades even today uh, when Ranger deployed. Uh, but there were uh, people like General Trainer and, and, uh, and, and people like that who were interested in doctrine, tactics, techniques in the future. Uh, they began to, to, uh, to come up with about seven or eight things in the 70s and early 80s that the Marine Corps would have to be better at if they were going to win. And, uh, and one of them, of course, was intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. Another was uh, better mobility so that you could have a better capability for all-around maneuver and the like. Uh, uh, you had to, uh, you had to, uh, we made a concerted effort to, uh, uh, to make uh, our decisions quicker than the other guy, which uh, evolved into the John Boyd's OODA loop uh, thought process and that fit right in. Uh, more flexible logistics, be better at combined arms, be second to none at NBC warfare, nuclear, biological, or chemical warfare was another, another one. And so these, uh, seven or eight ideas began to infiltrate, if you will, with everything that we did here at Quantico and, and elsewhere. Uh, the problem we had with a lot of it, uh, there was a lot of resistance uh, to these kind of things. Uh, uh, a lot of resistance within the Marine Corps, a lot of resistance to uh, any kind of new idea and all of that. And, and, and if I could uh, backpedal a little bit and say that it, it's when, when, when fiscal, when there's no fiscal money, when there's no uh, money available, and, and it's really difficult fiscally, like it's going to be here in the in the coming years, and like it was in the 1970s during the Carter administration, we had no money in the Marine Corps. We had uh, little to none after World War II, and we had uh, little to none after Korea, and yet that's when some of our greatest innovative ideas took place because it doesn't cost any money to think. And, and for example, we all know the history of the development of the amphibious warfare and what was done in the, in the, in the late 20s and 30s and all that kind of thing. Uh, after, after World War II, uh, the Marine Corps played a lead role in developing the use of helicopter and all that kind of thing in the late uh, 40s and early 50s and so on. Uh, later, refined to a great degree by the Army with their air mobile capability and the like. Uh, during the during the uh, uh, during the 70s, uh, when when we, uh, for example, we we sent uh, Marines like Jerry Turley to the Arab-Israeli War and people like we studied what they did. We were studying the the German idea. We were studying the Israeli idea. We were certainly going back and looking at uh, all that Sun Tzu had to say. And you know, I've got every book ever written. Uh, about him and, and so on, and Sun Pin and the rest of them. So uh, we were doing all these kind of things, and in the and that was uh, because we when we went to maneuvers in seventy six. I think 76. we barred the German uh, recon right. uh, armored uh, recon uh, 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 outfit from from the Germans, and that's when we started first playing with light armored vehicles and the like, and so. In the 70s, and again, without any money, we studied every light armored vehicle in the world. Most of them were built overseas, except for Cadillac Gage and some uh, garbage outfit here in West Virginia built one. But anyway, uh, so we, we looked at all that, wheel versus track, et cetera, et cetera. And so at the end of the 70s, and when we finally got some money with the President Reagan buildup, we knew what we needed. And we were able to strike like Genghis Khan, as I say. And by the way, Genghis Khan's another one that read all his books. And yeah, John, I was thinking you were talking about the uh, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Yeah. I remember another one from this exercise yeah. in, up in Germany, especially Holstein. Uh, the general had EA sixes up, yeah. and uh, we had umpires in our uh, combat operations center, and we were telling them how we were engaging these German uh, tank units that were well away from us. And they said, no, this can't be fictitious. You have to actually know where they are. 
and I had to take him into the uh, DAS, the Direct Air Support Center, and hear, have them hear the conversations between the EA-6 operators mm -hmm. and the, uh, the units on the ground before they realized. And that, that really was a forerunner to what became uh, mm -hmm. uh, J-STARS in terms yeah, of looking right. deep and that's striking right. deep. Yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of things like that, but and I think uh, the key again is that you know to to be able to uh, to be able to have these ideas and to be able to be able to use them. I mean, that was the kind of environment that we were lucky to be in, and even though there was a lot of resistance and so on, uh, if the commandant is backing you, uh, you don't have to worry about anything else. <laughs> And that's the way much of it was. Uh, for example, when uh, when uh, when General Wilson was commandant and all, um, you know, we did a lot of good work for him in a lot of areas, not just the NATO deployments and things like that, but in helping him uh, protect our air in Korea. We wrote all those papers and that kind of thing, and uh, and and he had uh, he had three priorities really. When he was coming on, they brought me here to run the development center, and uh, he was enthralled with the mobile protective weapon system, which had a, a, a high uh, performance cannon on it and so on. And he, uh, he and the head of the army, uh, General Rogers, got together and they had a joint program. Uh, but the army fought it because the army uh, was against anything that threatened their tank whether it was tank Division 70 or later the Abrams tank and all of that kind of thing. And, uh, but we had an active program with the Army and we did a lot of this mobile protective weapon system work. And we were also looking at the light armored vehicle. And then when the mobile protective weapon system went away, though, we were able to capitalize on, on the LAV opportunity and so on. And so uh, when, when the Congress, when the Senate Armed Service Committee asked us on the, on the 15th of uh, March, 1980, if we ha had a little extra money, would we be interested in off-the-shelf firearm vehicles? We said uh, yes, provided we could make some adjustments to them. We knew, for example, that we had to do some work with the, uh, the, with the wheels and the like, and we knew that we had we, we wanted to adopt the 25 millimeter gun that was on the, on the Army's Bradley because all the church integration work had been done, those kind of things. And so we were able to say yes. And when, uh, but we said that the money must come from plus up the defense. It can't come out of the hide of the other services. And so they gave us the money. Four years later, we fielded it, the, the light armed vehicle battalion that you were in. There was a direct relationship between the ideas and the experimentation. I was thinking of things like a yeah. high-speed launch off the amphibious yeah. ships of AAVs. Yeah. The, the ideas would be generated uh, in what you were talking about at yeah. uh, Camp Pickett, where you had the ideas, mm -hmm. you'd go out and exercise, come back and do the AARs, and then mm -hmm. try it again. Well, that's right. See, the other two things General Wilson wanted was landing craft air cushion and the high-speed amphibian. And these ideas came from the adoption in 1976 when we adopted the new amphibious expeditionary way of doing things, which was coming from over the horizon. And the reason we wanted to come from over the horizon was three letters, PGM, Precision Guided Munitions. And if you got too close too quick too early, you're blown out of the water. And so that's how that started, and that was the birth then of the of the JBX, which led to the uh, V-22 program. That was the birth, of course, of the Land Craft Air Cushion program, and that was the birth of the, uh, the high-speed amphibian, which later was called the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle, and then later was lost uh, because it took too long to field it, and so on. So those ideas uh, come, for example, uh, we had proved, uh, you know, data-wise, that if we were a thousand miles off the beach, uh, off of South Carolina tonight, uh, we could land tomorrow morning uh, anywhere between Rhode Island and Florida. That kind, so that's where the landing where they are, and that's where the maneuver flood process really became not just operational but strategic again, and all that. And so the and 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 uh, the, the Marine Corps and the Navy have have let this idea 
that the amphibious operations and all are no longer valid in the high threat environment. They've got to combat that because that's not correct and it's the only thing you have. And so, uh, and we're working on that separately. But the point I want to make is that, that uh, we sometimes, you know, for an outfit that takes great pride in its history, uh, we don't remember sometimes the reason why things were done. And, and uh, this is something that I think we want to bring back up. For example, uh, we should teach the Hogeboom Report. The Hogeboom Report was, uh, was developed in 1955 uh, by the assistant commandant. He headed the study. Uh, he had a lieutenant colonel on there named Jones, who later became a lieutenant general Jones of World War II fame, and, and our former commandant Jim Jones's uncle and people like that, and they, they, uh, they studied the, the structure of the Marine Corps after the, the uh, Korean War. And, and uh, in Aurelia, uh, they said the Marine Corps needs uh, division reconnaissance battalions, and the Marine Corps needs a force reconnaissance company. The Marine Corps needs more counterintelligence. Uh, the Marine Corps needs an all-weather day-night uh, attack capability which led to the A6A and, and the EA6A for the electronic warfare part of it. It said that, that the Marine Corps needs a what they called a uh, division uh, uh, radio reconnaissance company and a force radio reconnaissance company. Uh, now, mind you, there was, there was no money in the budget for any of this stuff in the mid-50s. These were all these ideas and concepts, but they were approved. And then little by little, requirements were generated and stuff like that. Little by little, the budget began to come your way on the things that, that were most critically needed. And this is the way it, it can get done. But you have to have a, there needs to be a vision. There needs to be a, a central vision that everybody's on board with and so on, so that everything they do, directly or indirectly, you know, impacts on that. And, and, and the ideas of corporals or the lieutenants are just as important as the ideas of the generals or the civilians, you know. Everybody's playing towards a common end, sort of a common end state, if you will, in, in terms of the campaigning thought process. And so uh, uh, this led, you know, to the radio battalions. And uh, everybody knows what the radio battalions are doing today. And, and they're even involved in the ISR bit, you know, if you look at the uh, historically, the battles of Fallujah and this and that, who did what with snipers and so on. How did the snipers know the targets were there? It traces right back to deception, radio of time, and that kind of thing. So all these kind of things, uh, you know, were embryonic then, but they they were understood to be part of the of the master plan. And uh, sir, well, as you're speaking about the central vision, I think it's fair to say that the three of you were integral in the central vision of maneuver warfare and the codification of that. Well, there were many others, too. Yes, yes sir. And, uh, well, now's a good time to talk about that. Yeah. Um, so there are two pieces I'd like to explore. One is your individual and collective role in bringing MCDP-1 into existence. And then the other part of that, and we can approach it however you all want to tackle it, is other key stakeholders. Um, other people who were integral in that process, and just uh, let y'all explain. Uh, maybe Mr. Schmidt, start with you. Your role and sure. So, so um, first of all, we talked about the, the transformation, the, the, the Renaissance. I always like to think of it as the Quantico Renaissance because, from my perspective, so much of what was happening revolved around Quantico. And and I I arrived in Quantico in 1986 at, at the Doctrine Command, which was the Doctrine Center, which was this little backwater center that wasn't doing too awfully much and I, I always wondered why General Gray when he became commandant picked this little backwater place to be the cadre for what became the warfighting center the epicenter of all this activity that was going on uh, but, but, I, but when he became commandant um, he started pulling people from everywhere in the Marine Corps and they all congregated here and, and it created kind of a center a critical mass of all the best and the brightest and, and, and the best thinkers in the Marine Corps, and it really the, built up a lot of energy, and it was and, and it was all sort of feeding on itself. And it was for a young officer to be here at that time was a really kind of heady experience. There were just sort of impromptu study groups and discussion groups, and that were taking place at Quantico and up at headquarters Marine Corps, uh, and and there was just a whole lot of intellectual energy surrounding the place. So um, so that was really neat to be part of. My particular role, I was in the Doctrine Center. 
Um, and I, I was supposed to be writing LAV Doctrine, but that never happened. I, I wrote a manual called OH6-1, Ground Combat Operations, which was sort of our capstone pre-doctrinal manual. And it was the first manual that we inserted maneuver warfare into. And um, I had been trying to, I, I was a true believer. I'd come from Second Marine Division. So I, as I was writing this, I kept putting maneuver warfare into it. And my boss uh, kept taking it out because at that time there were two candidates for, for common out. General Gray was one of them, uh, but he was kind of the underdog. And so my boss, who kept putting his finger in the air testing the wind, kept saying, take the maneuver warfare out, take the maneuver warfare out. And I kept putting it back in and he kept taking it out. And I finally got the manual done. And just as it was about ready to go to print, it's announced that Al Gray is going to be the Commandant. And my boss comes to me and says, put the maneuver warfare in the manual. So I, put, I shoved this very short little chapter on maneuver warfare into the front of the book. It, it was completely out of place. It was inconsistent with everything else in the book. OH 6-1 was not a f philosophy book like warfighting became. It was really an encyclopedic book. It was about this thick. And it was, these are the principles of war. These are the fundamentals of the attack. These are the seven types of offensive operations. These are the phases of the attack. Yada, yada, yada. It was, and then that it had a huge glossary in the back and it had all the map symbols. It was, it was a reference kind of a manual. And it was big and thick. But we had maneuver warfare in it. And so this was kind of our pride and joy. So shortly after General Gray became Commandant, he came down and I was supposed to brief him on OH 6-1. It never occurred to me, but I, I think, I realize now that I was auditioning for war fighting, but I didn't know it because everybody, myself included, assumed that the author yeah. of war fighting was going to be a colonel yeah. Yeah. who was going to work with the commandant. <clears throat> and as a junior captain, never. it never occurred to me that I would be considered. A, a so, frock captain, a lieutenant. A, yeah, a, a lieutenant, yes, with yeah. frocked as a captain. I was just sort of enjoying this from the peanut gallery. But anyway, so General Gray came in. Uh, should I tell the story? Tell the story. So, so we'll we'll see if Gen we, see we've been telling the story for years. We want to see if General Gray recalls it. So he came way. down to be briefed on OH 6 1. And it was General Gray and Captain Schmidt and Major General Mike Sullivan, who was the new director of the Warfighting Center, sitting around a table together, just the three of us. And God help me, I don't know what got into me. I, I, my defense is that I was a true believer. I started lecturing the new commandant on the Marine Corps and saying to him, General Gray, it's all well and good to write a new book that says maneuver warfare. And I held my book up and I sort of waved it at him like this. But I said, if you're not willing to make the institutional changes that are necessary to training and personnel policy and education and everything else, you might as well just throw it in the trash. And to demonstrate my point, God help me, I did this, I flipped the manual over my shoulder and expecting that it was going to thud dully on the floor behind me, not realizing that there was one of those industrial gray metal waste paper baskets directly behind me against the wall, and I hear this loud metallic clang sound. And the noise of it startled me, and, and I think it was that that sort of brought me back to reality. It made me realize how out of line I was being with the commandant, and I spun back around to see how much trouble I was in, because I was sure I was in trouble. And, uh, and I looked at General Gray, and the only thing he did was almost imperceptibly raised one eyebrow at me. That was his only reaction. And I'm convinced to this day that the reason I got the FMFM1 job was because I blindly flipped the book over my shoulder and, and put it in the basket. So do you remember that at all? I remember that. Yeah. So anyway, I, so I got picked. You got it because I was going to have revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I got assigned to write <clears throat> war fighting. Um, and I still don't know why I was considered because there were all these other people that were available. And I also don't understand why you chose to go into the Doctrine Center and pick somebody there instead of just bringing somebody in from the outside. But anyway, I was assigned to do it. Um, and so my job, I wasn't really, a lot of the arguments had taken place before I arrived. Um, and the concepts had been discussed and the terminology had been sort of agreed on. Uh, so when I, when I was given the job, my job was really to codify it. It wasn't, I didn't invent anything new. I was just trying to capture what, what was already there and, and, and what had been agreed upon. And, and, and I was trying to capture General Gray's vision. And the way, the way General Gray operated was um, he worked in parables. Because I'd ask him a question about what he wanted in the book. And he'd say, let me tell you a story about little Al Gray. And he'd, you'd tell me a story from Korea or something. And I'd, so I'd ask him a more pointed question. He'd say, let me tell you a story about little Al Gray. And I'd, I could never get the comment on to give me direct guidance uh, about what he wanted in the book. He was, and what I realized was that he was practicing maneuver warfare. He was giving me his intent, but he was not going to tell me how to do it. He was going to expect me to figure out the best way to do it and leave it up to me to accomplish the mission. And he told me, you have one guy to satisfy, and that's me. This book's not going to be staffed. You can talk to whomever you want. 
You can read whatever you want. You can incorporate whatever you want. If anybody tries to unduly influence you, you tell me about it, and I will make it stop. You have to satisfy me. And that's, and that's how it worked. That's how the book worked. And I, can I, I'll give one example. The, the very, we met twice over the course of the development of the book, over about four or five months, only twice. Long sessions. Though. They were some long yeah. sessions. And I remember the very first session, hours. I was briefing the general on the outline of, of the, my proposed outline. And I said, of course, General, uh, we'll start with a discussion of the principles of war. And General Gray said, what principles? And I was shocked. I thought, is it possible that the Commandant doesn't know what the principles of war are? So I said, you know, sir, the principles of war. And he said, which principles are you talking about? And I was completely flustered and flabbergasted. I, I didn't know what to say. I just kind of sputtered. And finally, I said, Moose Mus, General Moose Mus, you're familiar with Moose Mus. And he got, he got that, that sort of grin on his face. And he said, oh, those principles of war. And it was like he had punched me in the gut because of what I realized he was saying is, why are you so stuck on this list of things that J.F.C. Fuller had invented in 1919? There's nothing sacred about that. You need to be more creative than that. And, and I, I was shocked because at that time, the principles of war were sacrosanct. And I was thinking to myself, if the principles of war are on the table, everything's on the table. And I realized I had been thinking much too conventionally up to that point. And he was expecting something much bigger and much more radical and, and, and much more inventive than that. And it, w it just completely blew my mind. I went back to my, my cubicle afterwards, and General Van Riper came by, and he saw me, and I was just shaking my head. And I'm thinking, I don't know what I got myself into, because this is going to be big. General Grace wants something much bigger than I was prepared to give. But, that, but he didn't tell me that. The way he told me that was, what principles are you talking about? That's, that's, how, that's how it worked. Sir, would you mind explaining? Well, th th this period that John talks about, and he said there was electricity at Quantico, uh, th there would be ad hoc uh, group meetings, and you'd have a brigadier general and run the gamut all the way down to a, a young lieutenant or captain. It was never the grade, it was never the billet they were fulfilling, it was the merit of the idea. You had to come in there and, and defend your idea, and, th and there was the respect. Sir, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Captain, I do know. No, you don't, sir. And it would go back and forth, and, and it would go on. That was a little white building where the Gray Research Center was. There was a little uh, uh, one-story building there, and we would normally meet after quote working hours. Uh, go over there around 1730, 1800, get order pizza, and, and it might go 21, 2200 a night. And All these happened. arguments and debates about what, about uh, tactics and operations and weapon systems. And it was just uh, an electric period. A lot of it was a lot of it was spontaneous. The people wanted to do it. Yep. <laughs> and they were coming from where? From the from the end of the workday. Yes, yeah, exactly. They were, Everywhere. The, the, the ones who are interested in again, there was a, I say a direct correlation for the with those who were professionally schooled, those who were interested in a profession, who who read widely, mm -hmm. who studied deeply, who had a lot of combat experience, uh, had seen the anomalies of Vietnam. What we had been told, so-called received wisdom in Vietnam, didn't seem to work, and we wanted to know why. What what was wrong? Where what the thrift shop is today, yeah. sir? Where, Where that thrift shop was. That's what the thrift yeah. shop was. So uh, we were wrestling with the problem uh, of what was it the Marine Corps needed to do tactically and operationally. And when you came in with an idea, uh, there were no PowerPoint briefs, there were no lists. You had to come in and defend the idea. Yeah, I think uh, I think you need you need to go back again. Uh, a little earlier in time. You need to remember that, uh, for example, after the Vietnam War, uh, the Commandant then General Chapman wanted to reinvigorate Quantico in terms of thinking, doctrine, tactics, techniques, and so on. And so he directed that a uh, Operation Doctrine, Tactics, Techniques division be formed under the Development Center, which was in the that old building. He directed that we have a long range, a mid range, and a short range study program. And he ordered 55 officers into Quantico to, to build that up. That's why, uh, because uh, it, it had really uh, dwarfed down to nothing. And so that's how it began to get started. And the intelligence branch at the Development Center grew to an intelligence division and that type of thing, did all the threat analysis for the long-range studies, and that's when the Marine Corps again started to put out a long-range plan and a mid for 20 years out and a mid-range plan. That idea actually 
uh, goes back to 1963 and 64, when General Green was the commandant in, uh, in, uh, in 1963, he wanted to know, he was always thinking about the future. He was talking about sending Marines to Africa, rockets and all that kind of thing. And so he, he took arguably the smartest uh, general in the Marine Corps, named Gordon Gale, Navy Cross winner from World War II, and a squad of colonels, and he locked them up in that building across from the research center for a year. But before that, he said, I want a study done. And he came to us in special ops, because we had some contract vehicles and the like, and he directed us to make arrangements to have a study. Uh, on what the Marine Corps should look like in 1985, or what the world is going to look like in 1985. And uh, we went to Syracuse University, and uh, because we had been doing uh, SIGINT analysis work with uh, Syracuse University Research Corporation. And initially, the uh, regents that at the university turned the idea down, doing things for the military. And I had to go up and brief them. I was a captain, and I went up and briefed them. And so they said, okay, we'll do it. And they gave us a study, five volumes in a year. And uh, you know, you can't predict the future, but you can predict trends. And for example, this talked about the, the water crunch in different parts of the world, and the Golden Heights and the like. It talked about the food crunch. It talked about poverty. It also said that by 1985, now this is 1963, by 1985, the, uh, uh, the world is going to be more susceptible to terrorism and that the Marine Corps would be well advised to tidy up their relationship with the State Department because of their security guard program. So these kind of things were done. And then, so then Green took General Gale and this squad of colonels down to Quantico and said, now give me a long range plan. And they did, and they can, that was Marine Corps 85. That was the first long range plan of any service. And he did that. So the Marine Corps, again, not much money. It was before Vietnam buildup, et cetera, et cetera. We had, uh, under General Shoup, we had studied the, uh, uh, the ability to, you know, shoot, uh, uh, President Kennedy directed us to look at special operations and that kind of thing. And Shoup said, well, the amphibious operations are special enough, we'll just uh, focus our training on guerrilla warfare and that kind of thing. We built the guerrilla warfare training center in Okinawa and one at Pendleton and the one at Camp Assume. But uh, that's when the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, that's when the Army increased their special forces units. Uh, the Air Force created an outfit called Jungle Gym. It was a T-26 special ops kind of thing. Did a lot of work in South America, Latin America. And uh, the Navy took their old underwater demolition teams and created SEALs. And so that's how that all started. And, and so these kind of, the, the point I want to make is these kind of things are going on. You know, in, in a, it was a thinking kind of environment again. And then Vietnam came along, and of course, the, the big bill, everybody knows about that. And so that all of that kind of atrophied, if you will, it went down a drain to this period that you started your, your uh, question on, 1976 kind of uh, time frame. So uh, when, uh, by the time that uh, John, for example, got here to Quantico, though, all that long range, all that kind of work had atrophied again. They were down to three or four people. Jerry Polakoff, God bless him, was in charge of long range planning at the time. He had three people working for him. And no one wanted to come to Quantico uh, to serve, I recall. And particularly the development center. The development center and, and in some of the schools. Yeah. I was out in Okinawa and had, a, had had a fantastic tour as a regimental commander, the, the G3 of the division. I was the chief of staff and I had uh, a fourth year approved to stay out there. Came back for a conference and was called to Vampire. And, the uh, director of manpower said, uh, Commandant would like you to go to Quantico to take over a school. And he said, which one would you like to take? I said, sir, I'd like to take the basic school. He said, well, it's not going to be the basic school. Which one would you, which of the others would you like? I said, well, sir, it would be a toss-up between the officer candidate school and the ambulance warfare school. And he said, what about command and staff college? And I slid down in my seat because at that time, uh, this is always, Quantico has been the uh, crossroads of the Corps, but command and staff college was known as the off-ramp. That's where you went to retire. And I thought, I can't believe that my commandant's going to send me there. Uh, and, and again, mission type orders. Uh, the, the commandant never said, uh, do this, do that. He simply said, uh, this school has a reputation that the Marine Corps doesn't want any of its schools to have. Uh, I want you to lay the foundation that becomes the premier command staff college in the world and just turn me loose. And uh, other than to pay visits and uh, 
take books from my bookshelf, uh, uh, the, the Commandant left me alone. And it was, it was interesting because uh, when the Fleet, uh, Fleet Marine Force Field Manual 1 uh, warfighting came out, we had what we called an instructor, instructor management school. Uh, and they want, <clears throat> the director of the school got up in arms. Why are you using this manual in command staff college? Uh, we haven't approved it in our uh, systems development training. I said, because the commandant says we're going to use it. You want to go see General Gray? And he decided he didn't, so <laughs> we introduced it. Yes, sir. And then after command and staff, where did you go? I went uh, from command and staff, uh, and uh, well, G General Gray had a number of things he wanted. One was a, uh, he wanted a, a professional reading program. And that seemed to me like it would be an easy task. Uh, it became a very complex task because uh, we, we, uh, a program, again, we didn't farm out, but I sent it to officers I knew who, who read. And not only did I get uh, comments back, I got a lot of crit crit criticism of the list I sent out. So it took uh, about five or six months before we had one for the general design. And then, well, part of the reason it took so long is because he would keep adding books to it. Keep adding we thought we had the list finalized. Yeah, General was, Gray would add Crook's memoirs yeah. and something else. There had been there had been reading lists in other services for years, but uh, this was the first one that had enlisted people on it too. Right, and uh, that made it a little different. Uh, and, and one quick thing, when we looked at some of these other lists, they had huge lists, yeah. maybe a hundred books. And one of the things we discerned early on, no no one is likely to start a list of 100 books. Mm -hmm. But if you have, if you assign them by grade, so we had them for uh, all the way from young corporals up through, uh, through colonels, and, yeah. and eventually generals. Yeah, the only people that didn't have to read were the PFCs. They were supposed to read the guidebook. That, so, uh, and then about the time uh, I thought I was caught up, uh, General Gray said he'd like to have a university. And uh, no one was quite sure what it w was, but the, uh, the the general's guidance was we need to have something that pulls together uh, everything that an officer or an NCO does in their career in, in some sort of institution that brings it together. So that meant that you're going to have the then amphibious warfare school, uh, the basic school, command and staff college uh, uh, in some sort of institution. Staff NCO Academy. Academy. Uh, had two wonderful lieutenant colonels. Uh, uh, Tom Hobbs and Harry Barnes, who laid out the uh, the vision of what now is the Marine Corps War College, the School for Advanced War, war Fighting, uh, the, the the curriculum the Command Staff College adopted, a number of other things, and G General Gray came down and we briefed him on it, and I thought this is never going to fly. He gave a thumbs up and added the requirement that it would be de degree producing, that they would be degree, and and not a degree that we would get from another university. But the uh, that the Marine Corps University and the schools would become accredited in their own right, including including the correspondence program, including the correspondence, program. Uh, which uh, those who are familiar with this, the Southern Association for Colleges is one of the most difficult yeah. agencies to get a credit in, uh, and it took about seven years. Yeah, and then then of course with typical general Ben Riper. Uh, Attention to detail. They made the extension course, the correspondence course, harder than the rest of the course. Yeah. And I had, I had a, I, up a, I read all. I got all our books and read them. And came down and fixed that way. It's too hard. <laughs> and sir, I think I read somewhere that while you were president of the university, uh, you were sending mobile training teams out to the operating forces. Uh, to this is uh, interesting because uh, uh, war fighting was in its final draft stages, and I got a call from a division. Uh, G3, I won't tell you the division. Uh, he felt his division commander's uh, billet was in jeopardy, that the commandant might relieve him because uh, he wasn't proceeding quick enough with maneuver warfare. Uh, and he, I, I think he was resisting somewhat, so the G3 wanted to ensure that the, he, he, he protected his boss and got things up. And he said, could you uh, bring out a team from Quantico to help us to get a grasp of this? And I went back to what they called the bullpen, and the first thing I got was, well, we're overloaded, sir, we can't do this. I, I said, when the Fleet Marine Force calls, the Operating Forces call, you've got to go. So we put together a little four-person team, John Smith, uh, got 300 copies of the draft of, of what then was FM, FM1, uh, went, went out, and uh, we had to go to the field with them because we didn't have a budget for any hotels or anything like that. Uh, barely had enough, I think, airplane flights, all we could afford went out and introduced to this uh, division, starting with the division headquarters, all the regiments and battalions, uh, the ideas of maneuver warfare, and they, they quickly got up on the step and, uh, and, uh, and turned around. 
And that, uh, we called it the battle staff training team. Uh, it it uh, went over very well, and we quickly got requests from some of the Marine amphibious brigades and expedition brigades, the MEBs. And I think we did, uh, we did 7th MEB, we did 5th MEB, 1st MEB, uh, and 4th MEB uh, in the time I was here. And, and then, the, then there was a question, is a Marine Expeditionary Force, MEF, a warfighting headquarters? And believe it or not, there were some uh, officers who said, no, it's not a warfighting headquarters. It's simply apportions the resources that are within its uh, of the <coughs> units it owns. There were others of us who believed it was a warfighting headquarters, uh, and uh, so we began to go out with uh, this, and it, it became, this battle staff training program became uh, the uh, MAGTAF staff training program. Yeah, which really uh, originally way back when was a carryover from the amphibious program that used to go around the Marine Corps early on and teach the amphibious That's operations. right. Sir. And so, sir, if I can, I'd like to ask you, how did you decide on Mr. Schmidt? As the author, I'd love to know. <laughs> and I think I, I, I think before you ask that, you have to go back again, and and you have to understand uh, a lot of the people who are involved. We can't name them all. And you have to understand the politics and and, uh, and the way this came about. Uh, instead of uh, in in the. Uh, 70s and, and early 80s, instead of writing a book on maneuver warfare or a doctoral publication, we opted not to do that because it never would have been approved. I mean, I knew enough about writing doctrine and this and that. I had shepherded the SIG NEW doctrine through the Marine Corps as a young officer and this and that. It never would have been approved. There was a lot of opposition to it. And, and people like Bill Lynn and Jeff Record. And, and, uh, and many of the others who were pushing us. You need to understand now, uh, Bill Lynn, I mean, despite, you know, and, and we're good friends, but a lot of people didn't like Bill because he was very uh, antagonistic and he was very critical of senior officers and public and all that kind of, he wrote a, a series of uh, articles that were damaging to the Marine Corps and this and that and under different uh, commandants and different generals and the like. Uh, and so it was not a popular topic. Uh, also, the idea that it, uh, much it was heavily influenced initially by the German way of doing things, and, and all the people would say, well, hell, they got beat. And so there was a lot of opposition, a lot of the colonels, and a lot of people didn't want to learn anything new, and so on and so forth. The reason that, uh, the reason that we drove to this idea uh, all along was, was very simple. In any kind of conflict in, during the Cold War particularly, but in any kind of conflict that we could envision, we were going to be outnumbered. And if you ever made an amphibious operation, you're outnumbered there in the beginning too. And so it simply made sense to learn how to fight a different way when you were outnumbered so that you could win. And that's what maneuver, if you go back and study history, a maneuver type thought process is the only vehicle that ever did that kind of thing. So that's what was driving this thought process. But we, and you need to understand that you know, Bill Lynn uh, was also a staff advisor to the Center of Heart. And, the, the, and, and, and there were very powerful uh, people in Congress uh, and, and staff advising Congress that were pushing for reform and pushing for the maneuver idea and all of that. And so it was a, a somewhat of a testy environment. And uh, we were repeatedly told not to do this and not to talk to these people. And our answer simply was, we'll talk to anybody that wants to help. They're paying their own way, they're doing it, and we're going to be good listeners. You never learn anything while you're talking. And so, in effect, we took the Marine Corps way of doing things and ignored it, for the most part. And, and you'd get things like, uh, I had a force commander say to me, what are you talking about leading from the front? We always led from the front in my regiment. And he was a good, I knew him well, and he, he, was, uh, he liked me too, I knew that. And I said, yeah, who were your battalion commanders? He said, well, it was me, and he was a three-star guy, it was Bob Barrow, 
and a guy named Ross Dwyer. He was also one of our bright generals on the West Coast before he retired. So, I mean, this is the kind of dialogue you'd have. The key, though, is by, by, by doing it from the ground up, you're, you're creating disciples. And, and that's how, I mean, the, the, uh, we did everything as an air ground logistics team. Everything was MAGTAP, even though I was just a division commander. That was the agreement we had. We had a maneuver warfare board that helped publish these kind of things, publish the lessons learned, publish all of that kind of thing. They had a reading list. Mm -hmm. People like G.I. Wilson and Bill Woods and, and, and Captain Long, the logistician, uh, Captain Smith, General Smith's son who was killed in the Beirut bombing, he was on it. We had a great group of people. Uh, it was shared initially by uh, Sean Leach, uh, remember him? Sure. And uh, Leach had a good friend uh, at Ohio State University uh, who was an Army colonel and he pitched in. We had, we had other services uh, working on this too. One of, our, one of our big proponents was a major over the 82nd Airborne who uh, later ended up commanding JSOC and, and the 82nd Airborne and all that kind of thing. Down, major downs. And, so, and, and the other one who was con contributed so much was John Boyd. Uh, well, John, yeah, yeah, John came a little late. Yeah, John, John came in late. John uh, really, well, I met Lynn in 76 when, when I went up back up to Carlisle to the Army War College to participate in a, the annual National Security Seminar. Uh, Bill Lynn was going to be there. And P.X. Kelly called me up. He was head of programming and plans of programs. He said, you got to go up and meet this guy. There's a lot of controversy. He's written a lot of bad stuff. Let him uh, yeah, talk to him, teach him what you know. And that's how Lynn and I met. And we spent about five hours up there together, just one-on-one -on -one talking about tactics and this and that and strategy. And he was talking about, you know, the German model and all those kind of things. And I was talking about Sun Tzu. And it was great dialogue. But at any rate, but the point I, I want to make here is that rather than confront these people or anything like that, we just kept going forward. And and uh, I mean, it was it was it was it was not easy. I mean, you had the the three star general here at Quantico at the time uh, disliked Lynn immensely and, and uh, made no bones about it and wouldn't allow him on the base. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And so you, you had that kind of environment. So what we did, we built it from the ground up. And little by little, you had well-known Marine officers uh, become proponents. Now, I'll give you some examples. Uh, you talked about the thing earlier at Pickett with the airport. But we were actually teaching the breakout of an encirclement that day. And and, and it was the traditional layout where you, you had the you had the Eighth Marine Regiment headquarters with one with two battalions inside the encirclement and some tanks and other uh, combat su support capability, and you had a battalion and, and a tank battalion minus surround them, and you did the classic approach of putting checkpoints out in in 360. The uh, S3 of the regiment at the time had been my uh, training officer in the division, Ray Smith. He was a major then, later made, about to make lieutenant colonel. And uh, very well respected, a great hero in Vietnam, Navy Cross winner, and all that kind of thing, and a really, really, really good tactician. Uh, Ray was in this uh, combat operations center, had the radio there. Uh, a recon team uh, out by checkpoint 16 came up and said, we're over by checkpoint 16, there's nobody here. And Smith grabbed the radio right then and said, uh, Point main effort, focus main never now change. Everybody through checkpoint 16 and everybody wheeled around and escaped. And that's the afternoon that Ray Smith became a believer. Uh, Ray Smith later uh, commanded the battalion that went to Grenada and took eight of the 11 objectives at Grenada through maneuver warfare and all that kind of thing. So that was the first practical example of maneuver warfare. And if you don't believe me, I'll give you a I'll let you see a card here that uh, you can read it. It's uh, from Ray Smith. He gave me that uh, when he got back from, uh, from Lebanon. It says, General Gray, all the training done in mission orders made the difference in Grenada. Yeah. Ray Smith. I mean, so, I mean, so those are the kind of things we did. Now, we had another operation down at Lejeune with the 2nd Marines against the 6th Marines. Uh, they were commanded by uh, uh, Bill Keyes and, uh, and uh, Jim Livingston, the Medal of Honor winner. Uh, 
everything, everything was free maneuver, force on force. We didn't haven't brought that out yet, but it had to be force on force, and both forces were, you know, of about equal size. So you really had to think out there instead of having some scripted scenario. And uh, and in the middle of this thing, uh, all of a sudden, Bill Keys comes up and he says, "This stuff works." And, and so here you have another uh, proponent or another believer kind of thing. And, and, and so little by little, uh, the first thing you know, it was, it, it was not really a problem having adopted in the, on the East Coast because the air ground logistics team had been doing all these things and, uh, and General Miller, uh, Schwenk and then Miller, the force commander, were letting me do it, letting us do it. And so that was not the problem. And, but when John Smith's story is not exactly right, there were three candidates to be the commandant in the spring of 1987. Uh, not me, uh, the other Greg, uh, Dwayne Gray, uh, Ernie Cheatham, and Tom Morgan. And all three were very good and all three were qualified. My, I had my letter in retire. And uh, only John, John Lehman pigeonholed didn't send it forward or might have been long gone. And uh, the uh, when they finally had a, a, a rhubarb brew, brew about who to pick and so on, and, and uh, General Barrow, he was supporting one, General Wilson supporting another guy, and this and that and so on. And, uh, and then finally, uh, when they got done with the lottery, they picked up me in the end of June, in the middle of June. And so it was not, and everybody was going to, uh, maneuver warfare, you're right, it was gone. They, they were going to, you know, they, were, they was, couldn't wait to get rid of this crazy guy and, and get on with doing things uh, as usual. And so all that changed. But I, we had uh, deliberately not written, we, we did a bunch of writing locally, but we had deliberately did not write anything for Quantico or headquarters to get into at the time. Until you became commandant. Yeah. And then wh I thought one of the, from, yeah. the, from the point of view of a case study of institutional reform, which, yeah. which I think this whole period was a, was a great case study of institutional reform, yeah. what was critical is, is we had that grassroots mm -hmm. foundation that you had talked yeah. about, and it was, it was bubbling at the time. I mean, it was really enthusiastic, but it, it would have been killed off if the top of the organization, if the top of the institution didn't support it. Yeah. What became critical when you became commandant mm -hmm. is we now had top cover and we were protected to do whatever we want. I mean, so there was, uh, there was now freedom to do this stuff and we were being protected from the top. And one of the first things you did is you said, all right, now it's time to write my manual. And, and you know, we were off and running with it. Well, you, you participated in that discussion too at first. Yeah, sure. yeah. you helped out. Because I, I held off a while, you know, I, I took over in 87. We didn't uh, put the manual out until the spring of 89. Right. And, and in, in fact, there, there was a, a draft manual signed by the CG of uh, Quantico uh, Fleet Marine Force uh, Field Manual 2, mm -hmm. uh, and it largely was just a description of a Marine Air Ground Task Force. It, it really wasn't a, uh, a manual of how to do anything. And yeah. uh, General Gray got a copy and said, uh, let's stop the production of that. And so we, uh, down here at Quantico, it was stopped and uh, all the copies were, were pulled back. And then, of course, General Gray questioned if it's the capstone manual. Why is it, why is it two? number two? Why don't I have number one? Yeah. Uh, the, well, the, the the whole idea the the whole idea uh, was you know to do it at the right time and and, and to, we had a lot going on in eighty seven eighty eight. There were a lot of of changes, all driven for common purpose. But there was a heck of a lot going on, and a lot of it was controversial. I mean, if you just pick one you'd say that's enough. For example, the Marine Corps University. Uh, we said, you know, I said, I want a Marine Corps University. And I said it the second day I was there, the 2nd of July, 1987. Six weeks later, they came in with one of these PO and AM plans to study it. And I said, no, it, I want to do it. Uh, it's already been studied. In 1968, when General Masters was here at Quantico in charge, he had a study done by reserve officers, and it was titled Towards the Marine Corps University, several red volumes. And I was always one of Master's guys, and Master's sent for me to look at it. And so I looked at it and studied it and made a few recommendations to him and so on. He got, he, General Master and I went way back to the early days in, in intelligence and stuff like that. And so he gave me the study. He said, here, they're not going to do it. And the, one of the big reasons that we did not qualify to be a university was because Breckenridge Library wasn't big enough. And that's where that came from. So I kept the study in a footlocker. 
And then uh, in 1987, I said, do it. And so they gave me this plan to study it. So I said, now do it. And I said, I want you to stand it up on 10 November. Do you know what that date is? <laughs> and of sure. course, everybody knew it was a regular birthday. And so they stood up the university. I said, we'll fill in the blanks later. And that's when I told Shirley and the rest of them to study these different libraries and stuff like that, because we had to expand the library. I knew what kind of library I wanted. I wanted the one down at Maxwell. I had been down there about 30 times giving guest lectures and stuff like that. They really had a great program, but I let them figure that out. And they finally did. And, uh, and then we didn't call it a library. We called it a research center, because a library has an administrative connotation, and Congress wouldn't buy that. And uh, we, we talked DOD out of 10 or $15 million to get started, and the rest is history. We also used third party uh, money. We got the Command Staff College Foundation to buy all the inside of the research center and stuff like that. As I recall the story, there was uh, uh, Arnie Pernara, who was uh, Senator Nunn's uh, senior staffer on the Senate Armed Services Committee, was able to identify funds, uh, but it required three other committees' uh, approval. Uh, two very quickly uh, approved these funds, but because in the scale of things, wasn't much uh, in D.C. Uh, but another committee wanted to know why would the Marine Corps need a, a library, implication being that uh, it wasn't the intellectual aspect we know it to be. So. But he quickly overcame that yeah. and we had the money and yeah. uh, it, it, was, it was done inside the palm, which is almost unheard of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, to keep us on time, uh, I really appreciate uh, all the conversation. We've got about 20 minutes left. So what I'd like to do is offer an opportunity for each of you to offer some closing comments. But, um, like to change it up a little bit because one of the questions I asked is, uh, is it time for another round? The conditions or the environment that you described in 1976, 77, 78, they sounded an awful lot like uh, what may be going on now. So one of the questions is, what should we be doing now? So you described a little white building where people are getting together and regardless of rank, it's the the ability to have a conversation based on the merit of the ideas, and sir, you described the Second Marine Division Maneuver Warfare Board, where people are uh, excited about ideas and, and sharing and challenging. Um, what should we be doing now in the wake of our time in Iraq and Afghanistan, and are the necessary conditions present? And so, if we could, we'll just start with Mr. Schmidt. You can take a few minutes to think about it, but. Uh, Sounds like it was a very exciting time, and I, I wonder if we're doing that. I, I actually, I think we are in some ways. I, after I left active duty in 1993, I continued to be invited back to the Marine Corps University to talk about war fighting uh, for a few years after that. But then the, the institution kind of lost interest, and, and I stopped coming to Quantico uh, until just a few years ago, just a couple years ago, I started getting invited back again and uh, there was a lot of renewed interest in MCDP-1 uh, but it was interesting it, it was sort of renewed interest from sort of a, a historical perspective and what I realized is that a lot of the officers themselves were seeing a parallel between the Marine Corps of the late 70s and 80s trying to find its future and a Marine Corps now coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan in roughly the same position and they were interested because they were wondering if there was anything they could learn from our experience so I think certainly a lot of the Marines today see parallels and think it's time to revisit uh, where we are and what our doctrine needs to be from my personal point of view I don't I don't know that I feel close enough to it to say that we need new doctrine or not I, on, on the one hand we tried to be as timeless as we could with war fighting and and I think we succeeded largely, to, so to that extent, it, it ought to still endure and hold up. On the other hand, I'd like to think after 25 years, we've learned something, um, and we ought to be able to incorporate that experience and, and make the doctrine even stronger. So I, I have kind of mixed emotions about it. Uh, I'd love to take another crack at it, though. It would be, it would be an interesting exercise to do. I, I'd start with a book, uh, the most quoted work in the English language, but very few people have read or even aware of the book, and it's by Thomas Kuhn. It's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he introduced the idea of paradigms and paradigm shifts into our lexicon. And what he w said was in any profession, you have what's called receive wisdom. In our case, it would be the receive wisdom from the Basie School, from uh, the Amphibious Warfare, now Expeditionary Warfare School, Command and Staff College, the War Colleges. 
uh, and then you practice the profession using that received wisdom. Uh, and you can go through a whole career simply within that paradigm that you've received in your formal education unless there are anomalies. And if there are anomalies, that paradigm be begins to be questioned. Enough of them, that you have a crisis and the paradigm collapses and you need a new one. That's what happened to the generation I think uh, General Gray and I represented. Uh, we went to Vietnam and the received wisdom didn't work. So we came back disillusioned, uh, in some cases uh, embittered, uh, those who decided to stay and, and find out what was wrong and fix it, in a sense, created a new paradigm. Uh, General Gray at the forefront with maneuver warfare and all the folks he's talked about in support of it uh, uh, that, that, that did it. Uh, and this paradigm takes hold and now has been in existence for 25 years. The real question we need to ask of today's generation, have there been anomalies? Were there anomalies in Desert Shield, Desert Storm? Uh, were there anomalies in uh, we went into Afghanistan, first went into Iraq, and of course the later. I, I think one way you could find this out is to do what uh, all great militaries have done in the past, and that is do a historical analysis of your, of your recent uh, combat experience. We, probably the best example would have been the Germans. They had uh, 57 separate studies that they looked at after the First World War. Uh, and from that historical analysis, you see what the anomalies are, uh, and, and begin to then decide how we're going to how to make changes. Yeah, I think I think we have to. I feel very strongly that that uh, FMFM one or the MCDP one. I think that it's a philosophy, not a doctrine, and that philosophy is held till now. And I think uh, the philosophy is. Uh, exactly right on for the future. And that's why I think in part the Commandant's uh, stressed uh, reading it again and, uh, and uh, there are quite a few units. Uh, I just got an email the other day, everybody in my outfit reread re Warfighting. And, and the reason I say that is, uh, is because uh, the, the philosophy is the maneuver warfare is the wrong term really. We didn't, have, we didn't know what to call it. And we argued about that for a long time, talked about it, and so on. And, and, but, but it's fine now, but it's a maneuver warfare and a thought process. It's a thought process. That's all it really, really is. It's, a, it's an expanded thought process, and, and it, 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 it empowers people, and it hopes people uh, get involved in creative thinking, and it, it tries to teach people that uncertainty and chaos can be your friend and you need to be operative in that kind of an environment and all that kind of thing if you're going to be successful. And even, the, even all that's been written about fourth generation warfare and that type of thing really uh, blends right into the new warfare thought process. It's really, it's really just an extension of it, as Paul would point out, in terms of some of the things that your wisdom, if you will, uh, as you look to the, to the future. It's, it's, uh, but, uh, but a lot of, uh, you know, all the things, there's nothing in there that can't be used today and tomorrow. Uh, there may be some things uh, not in there that can be used, and that's one of the things I think that you, reason you want to do what General Van Riper is saying, go back and do your historical analysis of where you've been and what you did and so on and so forth like that. And, and I think that uh, more importantly than what we should do now, We've got to remember that we're naval in character. We've got to understand that we're amphibious and expeditionary. We've got to get the Navy back up on the step in terms of coming from the sea and doing what you can in, in what we call a striking fleet kind of an environment. We need to we'll go back and have uh, multiple war games, not just small war, but, but big time war games. The generals need to be involved. The colonel, everybody needs to be involved including the staff NCOs, and we need to, we need to go through, a, a, as you said, sort of an intellectual renaissance again here about our profession and what we can do to be better. And, and we, but we need to do it in, in a way, as I told the Sergeant Majors here earlier today, we need to do it in such a way that the young people who have fought so well in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa and around the globe, uh, that, 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 that they don't feel that that's all lost. I mean, they're, they're good. They're, they're very good at what they do. We just need to teach them 
and show them more of the things they haven't been doing and talk about some of the things they ought to be thinking about. And, and, and I think that's where uh, we really need to, uh, you know, the, the uh, I don't think the, uh, I think the senior officers need to be energized a little bit in this whole arena. Everybody's kind of sitting around uh, waiting for the shoe to drop or looking for what's going to happen next and this and that and they're feeling kind of comfortable uh, in what they're doing and, and it's not a comfort <coughs> profession. It's a profession where you're out there trying to, to get better at all times because the, 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 it, it's not how how ready you can be. Anybody can be ready to get on a ship or get on an airplane. It's are you prepared to win or be successful? And that takes study and thought and what if games and all that kind of, that's how, that's how you get better in addition to reading about things and all that kind of thing. So I, I think that's, uh, that's the route that they ought to go. Gentlemen, could I come back? The gentleman Gray mentioned earlier and I wanted to pick up on it was force on force. That's one of the things I think uh, I've ever observed have slipped away. Yeah. Uh, if you don't do force on force, you're kidding yourself. Uh, if you do one-sided exercises, mm -hmm. uh, one-sided side, exercises against a script or teaching point, mm -hmm. it's a waste of time. Uh, and, and that's not only in the field with exercises, but that's in the schoolhouse. When you're in the schoolhouse, if, if they're doing an exercise, there ought to be a living, breathing opponent on the other side going back. And, and one other quick thing on uh, on opening up a document such as war fighting for revision. The only reason it was opened up previously is because it was a very unique document, uh, small, short, easy to read, very powerful. Uh, and then when I be returned here uh, after having been the president of the university, I came back as the commanding general of the Combat Development Command and I had responsibility for doctrine. I looked and there were over 300 doctrinal publications. And as I began to look through the titles, clearly titles that had nothing to do with doctrine. So I had a very smart colonel by the name of Bob Dobson who came back to me with the recommendation we would have 10 high order doctrinal pubs called Marine Corps Doctrinal. Then the tactics, techniques, and procedures would be warfighting pubs. And then we'd have an unlimited number of reference pubs. That meant uh, that FMFM1 was going to have to fall into this new category of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, following the staff functions, uh, and would be certainly reprinted. Uh, and, and one of the uh, errors that was made in reopening it was uh, uh, center of gravity was reintroduced, which was a loaded term, where what John Smith had done was take critical uh, vulnerabilities and, and made it a much better term. So anytime you open a, a document for revision, uh, you can get uh, problems and never confuse intellectual activity with staffing. Hmm. Warfighting was never staffed in the sense that we know staffing. It was General Gray who uh, shared it with uh, individuals he had great respect for uh, and, and enlisted their advice, but, but it, it didn't go around the entire Marine Corps where everybody had a chop at it. It, was a, it retained its power and coherence. Typically the Iron Majors. <laughs> I mess it up every time. <laughs> Thank you gentlemen so much.